Live from your public media studios, WVIA presents Keystone Edition Business, a public affairs program that goes beyond the headlines to address issues in northeastern and central Pennsylvania. This is Keystone Edition Business. And now, moderator, Chris Jones. Welcome to Keystone Edition. I'm your host, Chris Jones. Pennsylvania's unemployment rate was 6.6% in November, but there are thousands of job openings in the past month alone in Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. So where's the disconnect? There's no easy answer. Do you need a job but don't know where to start? We have experts ready to help. You can reach out by phone at 1-800-326-9842, email at keystone at wvia.org, or on social with the hashtag Keystone Business. But first, WVIA's Paul Lazar takes a look at unemployment, job availability, and barriers to employment. A common criticism of Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania is that there aren't any jobs. However, there have been more than 9,000 job postings in the last 30 days in Luzerne and Lackawanna counties alone for various skill levels. The healthcare industry in particular is struggling to find workers with openings in everything from entry-level positions to psychiatrists. How are there so many jobs, but still so much unemployment? Right now, the pandemic is playing a large part. Many parents can't work because their children are home from school and child care centers are also closed. Often, people who are considered high risk of becoming critically ill from COVID are afraid to work and are trying to live off their savings. Another key piece to the employment puzzle is a mismatch between the public transit map and the job center map. Many buses don't run to industrial centers and there are limited schedules for the ones that do. That means a limited number of options for someone who doesn't drive and can't access reliable transportation. So what businesses are hiring and what positions do they want to fill? Fastenal, Geisinger and Lowe's are the top three employers looking for workers. The highest number of openings are for stockers and order fillers, retail workers and registered nurses. For more information, visit WVIA.org. For Keystone Edition Business, I'm Paul Lazar. Hey guys, welcome. Terry Ooms from the Institute for Public Policy and Economic Development is here in the studio to talk about the Institute's workforce development. Alex Grover is also here. She's the COO of I2M Manufacturing in Mountaintop. And finally, Gretchen Hunt Greaves joins us via Zoom from Commission on Economic Opportunity. Welcome. Terry, we're gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit more about the Institute for Public Policy and Economic Development. Sure. Our organization is a very unique collaborative of 13 higher education institutions located in Lackawanna and Luzerne County in the business community. We were formed in 2004 with the sole purpose of providing data, analytics, and interpretation of that data in order to help community leaders from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors make more informed decisions. And, and to look at other communities around the country where they're experiencing the same issues and opportunities and see how they're solving problems and enhancing the economic opportunities in front of them. Um, our work uh, is focused in a number of areas like education and workforce development, healthcare, housing, uh, economics. And um, we've been spending a lot of time on workforce development over the past couple of years because even pre-COVID, there have been significant challenges regionally, uh, and we anticipate those challenges uh, to last for the next couple decades. Yeah, it's really been amazing to watch the work that you've done and the contributions you've made to Northeastern Pennsylvania, so thank you so much. Thank you. Gretchen, tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do at CEO, the Commission on Economic Development. Thank you. So uh, the Commission on Economic Opportunity is a uh, private nonprofit organization that uh, really focuses on supporting uh, families, children, and seniors who um, are struggling to meet their ba basic needs. So our programs uh, focus on housing support, uh, food assistance, uh, workforce development, and um, employment services, as well as um, even you know, uh, basic home repairs and, and things uh, just to enable uh, families to have energy efficient homes where uh, their utility bills are affordable. So we have a whole host of programs that really focus on um, helping families who um, have low incomes uh, to live um, healthy lives. It's really amazing uh, as well, the work that you've done, uh, your organization over such a long period of time here in Northeastern Pennsylvania, thank you. 
Um, Alex, let's move over to you. Tell us a little bit more about I2M. Are you hiring? And what are some of the ideas and ways that you go about finding employees and keeping employees? Yeah, so um, I2M is a manufacturer of uh, flexible polymer films, um, so largely used in a variety of waterproofing, uh, waterproofing applications. Um, and so uh, like a lot of manufacturers in our area, we absolutely are hiring, and um, it's been a main priority for us, uh, I'd say, for the past six months or so. Um, so we, we really recognized uh, right around August that we needed to adapt our hiring strategy in order to be successful in a, a pretty unique um, employment market. And so uh, I can certainly go into um, a couple of examples, but high level, there were really three things we did. So um, the first is we really identified what are some of the barriers to uh, prevent people from coming to work, uh, wanting to come to work, or um, uh, applying for a job with us. Um, the second thing we did is we, we really worked to identify some of those intangible traits that make someone um, successful in a manufacturing environment, regardless of whether they've had a traditional manufacturing experience. Um, and uh, the third and final thing we did is, is we invested and we um, hired a manager of culture and recruiting um, because uh, talent development and building our team, uh, I think, frankly, it's something that all small and medium-sized businesses who are looking for uh, looking to add to their add to their employees um, need to do. And so, really, those are the the three core things we've done, and um, continuing to to use those strategies to grow our team and um, looking to add more uh, even today. Alex, that's amazing. And so, this talent manager, it's almost like a culture czar that you guys have there at I two M, right? Yeah, that, that's uh, that's a great way to put it. Um, I'll have to have to bring that one back. Uh, so our our manager of culture and recruiting, she's largely responsible not just for the recruiting of the candidate and um, you know the day one interview. Instead, it's okay. Let's have this. It's recruit then orientation um, followed by the first thirty days and the next sixty days check ins. Um, we have a lot of people who are totally switching careers. Um, they're they're moving from uh, maybe the restaurant industry and now they're moving into manufacturing and that can be a scary transition and so having someone who's there to help them check in along the way as well as conduct a, a variety of other sort of fun uh, value add types of activities I really think helps differentiate us from some of the other manufacturers in the area. Just really outstanding. Terry we're gonna come back to you so you know we had so much engagement um, when the promo videos came out for this show there are a lot of workers in our community that are struggling to find a job. They don't think that the jobs are there. And then there are employers who are saying, um, where are all the employees? You know, we want job applicants. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe on the one hand, you know, what are some of the available jobs? Um, and then on the other hand, what are some of the occupations that um, are, are in demand as well? Certainly. Um, our data tells us that there has been about 46,000 job opportunities posted over the last 30 days in the entire WVIA viewing area. They cover over 700 different occupations and 22,000 different job titles um, and a variety of skill and education levels. So what we're seeing is demand for individuals with a high school diploma credentials and certifications, two-year degrees, four-year degrees, and professional degrees. Um, so there is some opportunity out there. Um, there is obviously a disconnect because there are some people looking for work that, that can't find work. We know that there are barriers to employment such as childcare and daycare and even individuals who are concerned about going to work because they feel they're at high risk mm -hmm. for the coronavirus. So th there is that mismatch. Um, I think we also need to, to realize that people are thinking differently now and as Alex so appropriately said, switching careers and it's a, it's a great time to consider new opportunities and if we can still in people, you know, the opportunity for lifelong learning and education, um, I, I think we'll, we'll find more matches. Um, but the, there are jobs, there are people, we just need to make those connections, but most importantly, eliminate the barriers that are keeping the people from wanting to work and work full time being able to work. Yeah, let's go ahead and dive into some of those barriers. Gretchen, you know, CEO is somewhat on the front lines here trying to help 
people through some tough times. Can you speak to some, what are some of the barriers that are sort of in the way of connecting uh, people looking for a job and people looking to employ them? Sure, so, so a couple of things. Um, and I, I wanna note that a lot of this is uh, straight out of our experience with uh, community members. And some of this um, that I'll, what I'll report on is, is out of research that actually we did in partnership with uh, the Institute. So um, some of the things that have come up as, as issues for both our clients and um, consumers, as well as participants in our surveys, uh, talk about um, childcare as being a major issue. Uh, transportation. Um, so if you can just for a second kind of put yourself in someone else's shoes and say, um, I have uh, school age children and preschool children, I don't have a car. So um, the, the way your day would look if you worked a full time job is you would get up in the morning, get everybody ready for school and or child care, um, drop everybody off. Um, by way of a bus, meaning you know, walking to a bus stop, taking a bus, um, getting to uh, the childcare or the school, and then then going on the bus uh, to to work. So that means your your day probably starts two to three hours before your shift, and ends two or three hours after your shift. Um, and and so if you if you put all that together, that that really makes it difficult for somebody who has both children and childcare uh, concerns. Some other things include um, things like schedules and just flexibility. So in particular, um, people that have children, um, unexpected things happen, right? Um, you have situations where you have a sick child or where uh, there's a snow day from, from school or, you know, and that, that's all pre-COVID. And nowadays we have um, so many folks who are doing school at home and um, trying to teach remotely, teach their children remotely and, um, and maybe even work remotely at the same time. So schedules, um, when when someone, in, and understandably so, the employer needs someone to show up at work every day, right? But um, having some flexibility in scheduling and allowing um, the employees to be able to adjust their schedule and work around things that, that may come up in their lives because that's, that's part of reality. But we have so many, um, so many families who the parents feel as though, well, first of all, they may have had the experience of losing a job because they missed too much time due to a child's illness. Or even if it's not a child, maybe we have a lot of folks who, who take care of um, disabled or elderly parents. Um, and uh, that that comes into play when we look at uh, having, having the ability to work. And uh, some other things that, that we, that, that I think we don't consider is just how hard it is to uh, move forward when you have nothing. So imagine you are um, unemployed, you've depleted all your savings account and you do have a car and you do get a job and you get to work, but then what happens when your car breaks down? Or what happens when there's you know an emergency situation and you don't have the funding, um, you know, the, the finances in the savings account, because you already depleted that um, to, to take care of that, that concern. So, so here you're calling off of work and you're losing your job because you can't fix your car. Um, so, so just, it, it's, it's almost, um, you know, it, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So you, you, have, you have no money, you can't get to work when you can't get to work because you have no money and, and it's just this, this constant cycle. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, it, we're going to come back, and Alex, we're going to ask you about some of the stuff you're doing at I2M, but we do actually have a live caller. We have Sean from Scranton. Yes. Hey, Sean. What's your question? Hi. Yeah, I'm 57. Uh, I lost my job back in April, and uh, obviously 57 is in the best age to be started looking for a job. And, and I do have a slight... Uh, 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 I can't think of the, the word all of a sudden, though, with, with, with the lungs. Um, but anyway, I was just curious, you know, like, what is there any opportunities out there? Sean, first, um, wishing you a, a, a successful and healthy 2021. Thank you so much for calling. Um, you know, any of the panelists here feel especially uh, encouraged to, to answer this? Gretchen mm -hmm. or um, Terry? 
Uh, I, Sean, I, I think there are opportunities out there. I would encourage you to, to talk to the folks at CareerLink, um, to get online to something like Indeed.com, where job postings are, um, and, and look up job titles you're familiar with or skills um, that you have, and, and maybe not be focused on the job titles, but I, I think there's opportunity. And I say that because employers are starting to recognize that they need to change the way they recruit and hire and utilize employees. Um, we're in a job market now where there, there is some opportunity um, and there are people available to work. There may be a skills match, but we also have a volume issue. And this started pre-COVID when employers were having trouble finding people to fill jobs. And the issue is that there are a number of people exiting the workforce due to retirement. This is when the baby boomers start leaving. And um, there's a larger number of baby boomers than there are younger people following behind them. So what you have is a sheer math problem. You have more people exiting than there are to fill the jobs, so you have a gap. Now, we always talk about artificial intelligence taking over some jobs. And in this case, it might be good because we don't have enough bodies to fill the jobs we have. Um, and so we expect this to continue for the next two decades as long as those baby boomers retire. Um, so there will continue to be opportunities at different levels. Um, I think another aspect of workforce development is education and training and looking at opportunities for certifications and credentialing, not necessarily two, four, six-year degrees because that's not appropriate for everybody, but there are opportunities through CareerLink, through LinkedIn Learning, and other resources to, to boost your skills and then look at how those skills are transferable across different occupations. But, but Sean, get some help, contact your local CareerLink. They should be in a position to help you. Excellent. <clears throat> Alex, I'd like to come over to you. And we were talking about some of the barriers, and I think Sean kind of gets at that. But what, what are some of the things, or, an, or one actual program, I know you guys have at I2M, uh, that deals with this challenge of, of um, you know, kids in, in, in cyber school um, and, and moms, I guess, uh, that are kind of getting pulled in different directions from their career and their responsibilities at home? Yeah, so um, it, it's actually interesting. I think COVID-19 has forced a lot of people to innovate and um, you know we're no different. So one of the things that we identified was a lot of our existing um, team members as well as you know future team members uh, were struggling, uh, particularly back in September with this, uh, a lot of their students and their kids going remote. Um, you know, they didn't feel comfortable leaving their 10 or 11 year old child at home and expect that they're actually going to be able to, to stay focused, get their work done, you know, have a healthy snack, all that good stuff. Um, so we recognize that we also had a lot of empty conference rooms. Um, we're no longer, you know, having visits from suppliers and customers like we traditionally would. It's all over Zoom. So with this empty space and this, this need of our, um, from our team, you know, we recognize that there was an opportunity to create what we're now calling the I2M learning space. Um, so we started with a, a couple of uh, students. We surveyed the, the members of our team, asked them if this would be something um, interesting, if they could basically bring their kids to work with them. Um, and uh, we got, you know, resounding positive feedback. And uh, we hired a, a teacher who's been absolutely terrific, a, a former vice principal at uh, Valley West with a lot of um, elementary educational experience. So he's there supporting the kids. Um, they engage in their standard, you know, remote learning programs in their in their typical classrooms. They all have headphones, so it's nice and quiet and peaceful. And then in, during downtime, they're either doing homework with the teacher, um, running around outside a little bit, uh, playing different games. Um, and you know, all of them uh, have really expressed uh, that it's it's a fun environment to be in. So um, it, in my mind, you know, the barrier is how do we allow people to feel comfortable leaving their kids at home and so that they can then get to work. Um, we've been able to uh, retain several, several key employees who I'm fairly certain, you know, probably wouldn't have the attendance record that they do um, as a result of our, as a result of our learning program. So. Um, it's been exciting to see and, you know, our, our objective is to continue to evaluate those barriers that exist and make it easier for folks just to be able to get to work. Excellent. We don't have much time left, but we actually had the opportunity to interview Dr. Kathleen Houlihan, 
who's a local researcher and a PhD. And we're gonna go ahead and play that for you right now. I've worked in higher ed a very long time, and unfortunately what I see is a lot of students graduate thousands of dollars in debt. They still have no idea what they want to do. You know, juniors and seniors in college still don't. STEM, which was created by the NSF in uh, 2001, helped to get everyone talking about science, technology, engineering, and math. But there's a lot of other industries that aren't necessarily falling into those categories. The horizontal industry framework aligns with the Department of Labor as well as the Department of Education and allows these individuals to organize in the same way uh, that STEM did around other topics. And so what we're really trying to do is to get businesses, uh, educators, and um, like I said, workforce groups to start to adopt this framework um, to bring people together. It creates a sense of belonging and allows a student um, or a displaced worker to kind of figure out where they belong. Individuals who are, are trying to find their career signal, it's, it's, it's critically important for them to have access to experiences and opportunities that will help them uh, identify what's right and what's not right for them. We've identified 33 different types of on-ramps, everything from going and getting your degree down to attending a webinar or um, it, it, going to a summer camp, you know, for, for a young individual. People have opportunities to learn everywhere they look, and they can learn from the traditional degree, but there's also badges and certificates and uh, hackathons and clubs and, and groups that are organizing and coalescing around a, a similar thought process. Find your network and um, start to build those relationships. The horizontal industry framework can help businesses start to make groups that are uh, able to see problems differently. If you can put these individuals together on the same team, they're gonna create innovative ideas for your organization. So that's really the benefit to the business um, beyond the fact that they can start to work with the educational system and develop curriculum. It's going to help their company innovate and connect and build relationships with their community. And that's really what it's all about. I think we need a lot of organizations starting to think about how we can get people um, back into the workforce. It's like finding a needle in a haystack for somebody who is unsure what they want to do. And if we can get the information, the right information to the right individual at the right time, they're going to be successful and communities are going to be successful. Excellent. Um, we actually have another caller here. It's Thomas from Wilkes-Barre. Tom, are you there? Do you have a question? Yes, I am. Your question? Yeah. What, what happens with semi-disabled workers? How do they go about it? So um, are you struggling to find employment, Tom? It's not myself. It's my brother. Okay. Gretchen, is that something that you could answer? We have about a minute, minute and a half left here. Sure, so um, again, I like to refer you to CareerLink and um, the as a, as a good place to start. Uh, there are resources uh, certainly for to help disabled individuals get back into the workforce once they've been out of work, particularly if they've been receiving um, dis any sort of disability benefits. So CareerLink is a really great uh, first stop for, for job searchers that don't Should know where to start. Me back to the prompter to the end. Terry, any thoughts for, uh, for Tom? Well, I, I think there's an opportunity to look now um, and, and study, like, like Gretchen said, through CareerLink, but, but also the job postings that are online through Indeed.com. Because uh, like Alex has been innovating at I2M, so are other employers. And other employers are now allowing for some more remote work where they didn't in the past, um, rethinking senior workers and how to get people back in the workforce. So I think there might be more opportunities now than there were six months or 12 months ago. And Alex, how about, you know, if somebody's semi-disabled, are there any jobs available for them at I2M? So um, there are challenges, of course, with being a manufacturer um, and, um, and some of the, the requirements sure in order to, um, to do that job. 
Um, however, you know, we're always interested in, in identifying applicants. We have found um, a variety of different people from multiple sources and different backgrounds. And we find that, you know, the more diverse the background and experience, um, generally the better the outcome and the better our, our team comes together. So um, happy to, to evaluate, um, evaluate any candidates that we get um, and uh, uh, continuing to look, look for more. Terry, just some closing thoughts. You've got about a minute. Um, you know, we talked about some jobs that are available, some of the employers who are hiring. Um, you know, what does it really take in this type of market to stand out and get the job that you love, that you'd love to be in? Well, one, I, I, I think it goes back to something Kathleen said in her video, is really finding out who you are and what you like to do. And certainly if you have a degree in a certain area, you know, you may find out that in practice it's not you. So the first step is understanding who you are and what you want and your strengths and an objective look at the, the hard and soft skills you have and maybe to approach jobs looking at that as opposed to focusing on a specific job title. Um, or an occupation, um, because remember, your occupation could be in 10 different industries. But again, it's the skills component that is extremely critical, and I, I think that might be a good place for people to start when they're unsure of where they belong and what they want. I think we're entering um, in a, a post-COVID world, a, a, a realm where there is opportunity for everyone with all different skill levels and all different educational levels. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our panelists for participating and thank you for joining us. For more information on this topic, please visit WVIA.org. And remember, you can rewatch this episode or any previous episode on demand anytime online or on the WVIA app. For Keystone Edition, I'm Chris Jones. Thank you for watching.